I'm thrilled to welcome Camila Shamsi to Politics and Prose, who's here to discuss her man book long-listed novel, Home Fire. A retelling of Antigone, Home Fire retains the explosive emotions of its source material as it holds up a mirror to contemporary Britain, exploring its attitude towards its Muslim citizens, its immigrant population, and its notion of Britishness and British national identity, building up to and if I may quote freely from the New York Times Review, one of the most memorable final scenes I've read from a novel this century. Home Fire is Miss Shamsi's seventh novel, and not her first to in or be nominated for a major award. Three of her novels have received, three of her novels have received awards from Pakistan's Academy of Letters. Her first novel, In the City by the Sea, was shortlisted for one of the UK's oldest literary prize. Her fifth novel, Bond Shadows, was shortlisted for the 2009 Orange Prize for Fiction and won the Anisfield Wolf Book Award for Fiction, which recognizes books that have made important contributions to our understanding of racism and human diversity. Her sixth novel, A God in Every Stone, was shortlisted for the Bailey Prize, the Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction, and the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. A prolific and diverse writer, Ms. Shamsi also writes regularly for The Guardian, where in 2015 she published a fascinating, a, fascinating a fascinating piece about her trip to Antarctica. This is Ms. Shamsi's first visit to politics and prose. Please join me in offering her a warm welcome. Well, thank you to Politics and Prose and to a very nice sized audience. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm going to start by reading the beginning of, of Home Fire because it's the beginning, it won't require any setup. Um, and then I'll talk a little and then maybe read a little bit more. Um, so all you need to know actually, because it's not instantly obvious, is that this is um, at London's Heathrow Airport. Isma was going to miss her flight. The ticket wouldn't be refunded because the airline took no responsibility for passengers who arrived at the airport three hours ahead of the departure time and were escorted into an interrogation room. She had expected the interrogation, but not the hours of waiting that would precede it, nor that it would feel so humiliating to have the contents of her suitcase inspected. She'd made sure not to pack anything that would invite comment or questions. No Quran, no family pictures, no books on her area of academic interest. But even so, the officer took hold of every item of Isma's clothing and ran it between her thumb and fingers, not so much searching for hidden pockets as judging the quality of the material. Finally, she reached for the designer label down jacket Isma had folded over a chair back when she entered and held it up, one hand pinching each shoulder. This isn't yours she said, and Isma was sure she didn't mean because it's at least a size too large for you, but rather, it's too nice for someone like you. I used to work at a dry cleaning shop. The woman who brought this in said she didn't want it when we couldn't get rid of the stain. She pointed to the grease mark on the pocket. Does the manager know you took it? I was the manager. You were the manager of a dry cleaning shop and now you're on your way to a PhD program in sociology. Yes, and how did that happen? My siblings and I were orphaned just after we finished uni. They were 12 years old, twins. I took the first job I could find. Now they've grown up. I can go back to my life. You're going back to your life in Amherst, Massachusetts. I meant the academic life. The woman dropped the jacket into the jumble of clothes and shoes and told Isma to wait. That had been a while ago. The plane would be boarding now. Isma looked over at the suitcase. She'd repacked when the woman left the room and spent the time since worrying if doing that without permission constituted an offense. Should she empty the clothes out into a haphazard pile or would that make things even worse? She stood up, unzipped the suitcase and flipped it open so its contents were visible. 
A man entered the office carrying Isma's passport, laptop, and phone. She allowed herself to hope, but he sat down, gestured for her to do the same, and placed a voice recorder between them. Do you consider yourself British, the man said. I am British. But do you consider yourself British? I've lived here all my life. <coughs> she meant there was no other country of which she could feel herself a part, but the words came out sounding evasive. The interrogation continued for nearly two hours. He wanted to know her thoughts on Shias, homosexuals, the Queen, democracy, the Great British Bake Off, <coughs> the invasion of Iraq, Israel, suicide bombers, dating websites. After that early slip regarding her Britishness, she settled into the manner that she'd practiced with Anika playing the role of the interrogating officer and Isma responding to her sister as though she were a customer of dubious political opinions whose business Isma didn't want to lose by voicing strenuously opposing views, but to whom she didn't see the need to lie either. So, when people talk about the enmity between Shias and Sunnis, it usually centers on some political imbalance of power, such as in Iraq or Syria. As a Brit, I don't distinguish between one Muslim and the other. Or, occupying other people's territory generally causes more problems than it solves. This served for both Iraq and Israel. Killing civilians is sinful. That's equally true whether the manner of killing is a suicide bombing or aerial bombardment or drone strikes. There were long intervals of silence between each answer and the next question as the man clicked keys on her laptop, examining her browser history. He knew that she was interested in the marital status of an actor from a popular TV series, knew that wearing a hijab didn't stop her from buying expensive products to tame her frizzy hair, knew that she had searched for how to make small talk with Americans. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be so compliant about everything, Anika had said during their role playing. Isma's sister, not quite 19, with her law student brain, who knew everything about her rights and nothing about the fragility of her place in the world. For instance, if they ask you about the queen, just say, as an Asian, I have to admire her color palette. <laughs> it's important to show at least a tiny bit of contempt for the whole proceeding. Instead, Isma had responded, I greatly admire Her Majesty's commitment to her role. But there had been comfort in hearing her sister's alternative answers in her head, her ha of triumph when the official asked a question that she'd anticipated and Isma had dismissed, such as the Great British Bake Off one. <laughs> well, if they didn't let her board this plane or anyone after this, she would go home to Anika, which is what half Isma's heart knew it should do in any case. How much of Anika's heart wanted that was a hard question to answer. She'd been so adamant that Isma not change her plans for America, and whether this was selflessness or a wish to be left alone was something even Anika herself didn't seem to know. A tiny flicker in Isma's brain signaled a thought about her brother Pervez that was trying to surface, before it was submerged by the strength of her refusal ever to think about him again. Eventually the door opened and the woman official walked in. Perhaps she would be the one to ask the family questions, the one most difficult to answer, the ones most fraught when she'd prepared with her sister. Sorry about that, the woman said unconvincingly. Just had to wait for America to wake up and confirm some details about your student visa. All checked out. Here. She handed a stiff rectangle of paper to Isma with an air of magnanimity. It was the boarding pass for the plane she'd already missed. Isma stood up unsteady because of the pins and needles in her feet, which she'd been afraid to shake off in case she accidentally kicked the man across the desk from her. As she wheeled out her luggage, she thanked the woman whose thumbprints were on her underwear, not allowing even a shade of sarcasm to enter her voice. So that's the beginning and that's Isma. Um, now, as you've already heard, this draws on the Greek tragedy Antigone. I want to say you don't need to know anything about Antigone to read it. And if you haven't read Antigone, don't feel that you should go and, you know, look up Wikipedia for a plot summary to see what it's about, because um, it does, I hope, stand on its own and, you know, it's its own experience. But, but I do want to talk a little about how it came to be, um, how I came to write this. There are always several beginnings to a novel. Um, and I suppose one beginning is that in 2007, I moved to Britain. Uh, so I grew up in Pakistan. I was at university in America. Um, 
After that, I went back to Pakistan, but was fairly nomadic and every year would spend some time in London. Um, and more and more of my life sort of gradually moved there until I knew it was the place that, that I wanted to move and, and live in. And at that point, there was a wonderful thing called a writer's artist and composer's visa, which basically allowed you to go in if you were earning some kind of living as a writer, which I was. Um, so I went in under this visa, and a year later, they, they just killed the visa. Um, and there was nothing to replace it. And there was this moment when I thought I would have to leave the country where I'd been living for a year and where you know I sort of was beginning to make a life for myself. Um, and I was lucky I found a different visa category to shift into. That was fine. But there was always this sense of um, uncertainty and this feeling that tomorrow they could change the rules again and I'll have to leave. Anyone who's been through migration process um, in the more difficult countries the world know what I'm talking about. So when I actually got my citizenship in 2013, there was a huge sense of relief. And one of the feelings was now I can stay. Now whatever happens, no matter what rules are changing, whatever governments are coming into power, however anti-migrant the rhetoric in the tabloids is, I can stay. Um, and then I was reading something, and there was something in there about a, a little known rule, which is that if you're a dual citizen, of Britain and some other country, then under certain circumstances, the British government can strip you of your citizenship. Um, and that at this, shortly after I became a citizen, Theresa May, who's now the prime minister, but was then the home secretary in charge of migration matters, was trying to, and did in the end, expand these rules to make it easier and more possible for the government to decide that certain people should be stripped of their citizenship. Um, and among the things I thought about was, you know, it was all very well for me. I had been a Pakistani citizen. I was in for most of my life. But I thought about my friends who had grown up in Pakistan, had Pakistani passports, then married, lived in Britain, had children in Britain, perhaps had married, you know, English, white English husbands or wives, um, and had children who had never had any home but Britain but were dual citizens of Pakistan because Pakistan will allow you citizenship by descent. And all these friends of mine just said, well, it's much easier if we get this you know, one piece of paper, this form, that allows our children to travel back and forth to Pakistan. They don't have to go through the visa hassle. They can go and see their grandparents anytime. And what none of them knew that when they did that, the moment they did that, they made it possible for the British government to take away their children's citizenship because now they're dual citizens. Um, and it's not known that this rule applies, of course. Um, and it sort of always was sort of at the back of my head as something that was sort of odd and interesting, largely because so widely unknown. You don't know it, the law exists until it's used against you. Um, and then, you know, I was in that point in a writer's life when I was not working on anything and didn't know what I was doing. And I got an email from a man called Jatinder Verma. Uh, who runs a place called the Tara Arts Company, which has been in London for, I don't know, 40 years. And they do a lot of theater around Asian and Brit British Asian themes. And he invited me for a coffee, and he said, you don't know who I am, but you know, come and meet me. And I said, OK. And he said, look, I like your novels. I like the way you do dialogue. I want you to write a play for me. And I said, but I don't know how to write a play. And he said, oh, I knew you'd say that. Um, so I have a response, which is adapt a play. Take a play that is, you know, ha someone else has done the work of it. Um, and he said, this was in 2014. Um, he said, the Greek tragedy, the Greeks are speaking to us these days. You're seeing more revivals of Greek plays um, going on. There's something in the air. He said, you know, something like Antigone, you know, updated for our times could be a good thing. Just go and think about it. So I said, okay. And I went home and I did the thing that I've urged you not to do, which is I went. <laughs> I went onto Wikipedia and looked at the plot summary of Antigone, which I had last read when I was at university and didn't remember. And so you don't need to know Antigone, but I'm going to tell you a very brief thing about it, which is that, and apologies to those of you who do know it and know it better than I do, um, but the premise of the play is there are two sisters. Their brother has been killed in war fighting against the king. And so the king decrees this body will not be buried. Um, as sort of, you know, we have to make an example of the traitor. His body will be left above ground to rot. And one of the sisters 
accept that. She said, you know, this is completely unjust, but we are weak women. This is the state. What can we do? We can't turn against it. And the other sister, Antigone, says, no. I don't care if it's the law of the state. There's justice. There are the laws of God. There are the laws of family. There's what I owe my brother. I'm going to bury him. I don't care what the consequences are. Um, and there were various ways in which, as I was reading this, this plot summary, I was thinking, because of course, you know, all these things have to become metaphor and stand in for something else. Um, I just started to think about things like citizenship and the right of where a body can be living or dead, um, and states that can take away um, the rights of people um, in different ways. And so that then led into um, this novel, and you know, you're going to have to read it to see um, exactly how. So that was sort of the beginning of it. But one of the things as I was reading the play in different versions, what started to interest me particularly was not just these big questions of do you accept the laws of the state or do you fight against injustice? It's very interesting because Antigone is seen in very different ways uh, by different people and in different societies. There are some who think she's a fanatic, uh, that she's reckless, that she doesn't know her own limits. And there are other people who think she's an absolute hero um, and that she is the individual who will fight injustice even at any cost to herself. Um, so there were all those interesting things. But at the center of it, there were these two sisters. Um, and one was called Ismeni. And my Isma, of course, takes her name from Ismeni. Um, and Ismeni is hardly there in the play. She has, you know, I think 80 lines or something in the whole play. But what was interesting to me is when I was reading one of the translations by Anne Carson, it's a fantastic translation. Um, and there's one bit when the Antigone character says to her sister, all right, you disagree with me. I'm going to do, go and do what I want. What do you care? I mean, if the king kills me, what difference does it make to you? And her sister just says, I'll be lonely. And right there, that play became human for me. And the characters became human because I thought, you know, yeah, of course, everyone talks with Antigone about these in terms of these huge, great motifs. But at the center, there's also, there are these two sisters, and one of them is seeing her brother's already dead. Everyone in the family is dead. There are only these two sisters left. And one sister is saying, I just want you to be safe. You're all I've got left. And the other one is just not hearing that. Um, and so Isma sort of became that character who you know, is, is loving her sister and looking at her sister, and her sister's off on some other tangent. Um, but within the, the play, there are another set of characters. There's the king himself, and then there's the king's son who is involved in various ways with the two sisters, well, with Antigone in particular. Um, and so he turns up in my book as well. So the way the book is structured is, there are five parts, and each part is a different point of view. Um, and someone pointed out to me that this was very clever of me because it mimics the five acts of a play, which I had no idea about when I did it. <laughs> but we're going to pretend that's exactly why I did it. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the second section. Um, and so the, and you can now forget about the Antigone parallels, and we're just going to go back to the book as it is. Uh, but Isma does manage to make it to America. Um, she's a little bit homesick, and she runs into a young man in a coffee shop who she recognizes because she's seen his picture in the paper. Um, he is like her, a Londoner, but quite different in as much as his father's an important politician. Um, his father, like Isma's father, is a British man of Pakistani descent, but has had a very different kind of career trajectory, has managed to become part of the establishment. Um, he's married to an Irish-American woman. So the son, whose name is Eamon, which can be either an Irish or a Pakistani name, depending on how you spell it. And he spells it E-A-M-O-N-N, -N, the Irish way. Um, so the son grows up sort of really quite deracinated. Um, and his father's made a break with his sort of the Pakistani family. Um, but she sees him. And she's, of course, intrigued because you know here's this son of the Home Secretary. He's sort of one of the most important, powerful people in Britain. The son is also rather good looking, which possibly doesn't hurt. Um, and they strike up a friendship largely based on being two Londoners abroad in a small town in Massachusetts. And, um, and when he's going back to London, she says to him, um, 
through some series of events, she's about to go and post something to her aunt, who's not really an aunt, but a close family friend, who her sister's living with, Auntie Nassim. Um, and he says, oh, I'm going to London, I'll, I'll post it for you. And he gets to London, and instead of posting it, he goes in person to deliver it. Um, and he has more than one reason for doing that, which we won't go into now, but I'm going to read the bit where he's basically walking towards the house, which is across the street from where Isma grew up. So it's Auntie Nassim, old family friend, and Isma's sister, Anika, lives in that house with her, and he knows all of this. Um, but it's also the neighborhood where his father's family used to live, um, the family he's now estranged from. So. Finally, he approached the street on which Isma had grown up, just off a commercial stretch of Preston Road. Now that he was here, he felt awkward about simply not posting the package, and he walked up Preston Road for a while, past a Jewish bakery beside an Islamic bookshop beside a Romanian butcher, before turning back towards Isma Street again. He was unable to let go of the feeling that behind these doors existed a piece of his childhood and of his father that he'd been too ready to forget. He knocked on the door of a pebble dash house and an elderly woman made small by age answered, wearing a shalwar kameez with a thick cardigan that signaled her internal thermometer was set to another country. This must be the old friend and neighbor, Auntie Nassim, in whose house Isma's sister was living while studying law at LSE. He said he had brought something for her from Isma, which made her open the door wide and reach up to place the palm of her hand against his cheek before turning to walk back inside with the words, come, have some tea. The Arabic calligraphy on the wall, the carpeted stairs, the plastic flowers in a vase, the scent of spices in the kitchen despite there being nothing on the stove, all brought back his great uncle's home, and with it, the shameful memory of his own embarrassment about it. He took Isma's envelope out of his satchel and handed it to the old lady, who laughed in delight when she shook it, guessing the contents. Such a thoughtful girl, that girl. Tea with sugar? At his response, she said, you British, never any sugar in your tea. My grandchildren are all the same. My daughter's half and half, one yes, one no. How did you meet Isma? What do you do for a living? She was amused by the story she, he told of the man who needed rescuing from an un, unmanned coffee counter, but made a disapproving face when he said, taking a year off, and that made him say, probably return to consultancy, but perhaps a more boutique firm. One of those personal shoppers, she said, and it took him a moment to place together consultancy and boutique to understand how she'd reached that conclusion. When he explained, she laughed, slapping his hand in a show of mirth, and he laughed too, wishing he'd known a paternal grandmother, a dadi. Soon she was frying samosas for him as though determined to inhabit a stereotype, while, as instructed, he licked the end of a thread and guided it through the end of a needle. She had moved to London from Gujranwala in the 50s, she said. His grandparents had come from Sialkot, he said. No, he didn't speak Punjabi. No, not Urdu either. Only English, she said. Some French? She said, my father fought in the British Indian Army during World War I. He was in France for a while, billeted there with the family. The sons and husband were soldiers, so it was just the women he lived with. Je t'adore, he used to say to his children years later. After he died, I wonder who taught him those words. Here, hold out your arm. The threaded needle was for him, it turned out. She had noticed the loose button on his sleeve, and he found himself looking at the parting of her dyed black hair as she bent, bent down to set it right, still talking away. Shukriya, he said, the Urdu word clumsy on his tongue. And after a moment's pause in which something else seemed necessary, he added, Auntie? And was rewarded by another pat on the cheek. He assumed all this affection and the generosity of her welcome was just the famed Pakistani hospitality his father sometimes spoke of, but then she said, so, Isma sent you to meet us. <laughs> he set down the samosa, which it was suddenly clear had been given to him under a false assumption. <laughs> Not exactly, in fact, no. I told her I'd post a package, but it was such a nice day, I thought I would take a long walk and drop it off in person. You walked here, all the way from Notting Hill, to see us. It's a nice walk. 
I like discovering nice new bits of London, in this case the canal, he said, which seemed an effective way of dispelling her misconception without either of them actually mentioning it. Oh, she told you how much she loves walking along the canal. He picked up the samosa and bit into it. Isma could set her straight when they spoke. He didn't doubt Auntie Nassim would be on the phone to her as soon as he left. <laughs> she said, you know, I've known her since the day she was born. Her grandmother was my first friend. We were living off the high road, nothing like today. There were no other Asians at all. And then one day across the street, I saw a woman in a shalwar kameez. I ran across in the middle of traffic and caught her by the arm. And we stayed there talking for so long, my husband came out looking for me. When we moved to this street, we said to them, come on, we can't separate. So they came. And here Isma was born and grew up. So much sadness in her life, looking after the twins from such a young age. It's time someone looked after her. He was spared the further embarrassment of this conversation by the sound of footsteps coming down the stairs. We have a guest, a very nice young man. Isma sent him. The footsteps retreated up the stairs and the old woman's voice dropped. Anika, she'll come down again once she's fixed herself up. In my days, either you were the kind of girl who covered your head or you were the kind who wore makeup. Now, everything is ev now everyone is everything all at the same time. He had been about to leave, but instead he reached for another samosa. A few minutes later, the footsteps approached again. The woman who walked in was smaller than he'd expected from the picture, petite really, and without any of the sense of mischief he'd seen in the, most in the photograph, but just as beautiful. Eamon stood up, conscious of his greasy fingers and of the question of how he might use them to unpin the white hijab that fra framed her face. She greeted him with a puzzled look, which confirmed how unlikely it was for Isma to have sent someone like him to have met to meet the family. The old lady introduced him by his first name, which was all that he had given her, and Anika's expression didn't so much change as ossify. That's spelt with an E, not an A, auntie. It's Eamon Loan, isn't it? Isma told me about you? No, I recognize you from the photographs, in the pictures, in, in the newspaper. What do you want here? Why do you know my sister? He met Isma in Northampton at a cafe, the old woman said, coming to stand next to Eamon and placed a hand on his arm, looking at him apologetically, not only for the girl's behavior, but for her own, oh, of disappointment when the girl mentioned his surname. He walked all the way from Notting Hill to bring me M&Ms from Isma along the canal. The beautiful girl looked at the envelope with Isma's handwriting on it and then at him, her face confused. It's a lovely walk, he said. The canal flows above, above the North Circular along an aqueduct. I never knew that. The IRA tried to bomb it in 1939. It would have flooded all of Wembley. He had no idea if this last detail was actually true, but it was the only thing he knew about the aqueduct, and he wanted to say something interesting so that the girl would see he might be the kind of person her sister would choose to have coffee with, and not just a posh toff who seemed so out of place in this kitchen and in Isma's life. Helpfully, he added, you can see news footage about it. Just search for North Circular Canal Bomb or something like that, and it'll come up. Right, she said, because that's a good idea if you're GWM, isn't it? I don't know what that is. Googling while Muslim. <laughs> now, all Muslims know the Googling while Muslim issue. Um, in this case, the family has particular anxieties around these matters. One of the things I was thinking with, with the original play when I was deciding what do I use and what do I discard, um, and I thought about the fact that in the original story, uh, Antigone and her siblings are the children of Oedipus, and so they have this family stain on them because they're the children of incest, and I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. But then I quite liked the idea of them having some kind of shame or guilt in their life. Um, and the particular shame or guilt in their life, which you learn fairly early on, so it's not too much of a spoiler, um, is that their father was a jihadi. Um, and he started in the days when that word didn't have the kind of weight and resonance it did. Um, he went off to fight in Bosnia in the, f in the 90s, and then he, flew to, he fought in Chechnya and in Kashmir. But then he was in Afghanistan in 2001. 
um, and they lost sight of him. They never knew him. He was an absentee father all their lives. But there is this backstory in their lives. And they're growing up in a Britain of today and a London of today and a world of today um, when you know that you don't want anyone to know if that's who your father was. So this is the secret in their lives. Um, and it's the other thing that makes them at such odd with Eamon and his father, because his father, of course, is is a British Muslim, is from the same neighborhood, um, but he's in charge of matters such as terrorism, migration, domestic security. Um, and so that history becomes convoluted and complicated, um, and particularly through the life of the third sibling who you haven't met, um, Pervez Anika's twin, who is notably very absent from the story so far, though at some point, if you read the book, you will find out why he's absent um, and what he's all about. Um, but I'm going to stop talking there and sort of open it up in, in the hope that someone might have questions for me. Yes. Thank you for coming. And thank you, uh, thank you to Politics and Prose for organizing this. I'm a big fan. Mm -hmm. I've read every book. And now I'm gushing, so I'll stop and I'll ask my <laughs> two questions, <laughs> okay. one related to the book and one not. OK. Uh, I'm going to ask for anyone who has read the book to try not to ask questions that have too many spoilers in them, which is not always I'm easy. I'm going to try. <laughs> try. Yeah. So uh, in the beginning, I got a sense that Isma was falling mm -hmm. uh, for uh, mm -hmm. Eamon, mm -hmm. uh, but not to spoil it, but he wasn't feeling the same. So mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about that? And um, my second question, which is not related to the book, is could you talk just a little bit about your perspective about India-Pakistan relations? Uh, I'm from India, by the way. OK. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, the, the Eamon Isma relationship, it's the first relationship of the book. You know, it's where it starts. What I'm not going to do is answer your question, because actually um, people have different readings of it. And there are various points in the book that I leave certain things open. Um, and part of what I wanted to do with the five-part structure is, is you have each part is one character's point of view. Uh, you see how they think of the other person, what they're assuming, what they're implying, what they're judging. Um, and you never know in that moment what the other characters in the scene are thinking of them. And later on, you might see. So you have a later section of Eamon where he does talk about Isma. Uh, but I, for me, the interest of the book was actually in seeing, now you're in this viewpoint, and this is how the world looks. And now you're in this viewpoint, and this is how the world and the characters look. Um, and to see, w as the readers, what kind of conclusions people might reach um, about who feels what for whom and why and who's right and who's m judging and who's misjudging. Um, India and Pakistan, um, yeah, not very nice these days. And what can you say? You know, we, we could do many hours on it. Um, it's, it, you know, I don't think anyone on either side of the border at, at the 70th anniversary could fly nationalistic f flags and say, aren't we doing well? <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much. I haven't read it yet. I will uh, read it, mm -hmm. not least because I live in a shitty little country that you are now a citizen of, and <laughs> I work there at the University of Reading. Yeah. Um, my question, therefore, in a sense, reflects my experience living there and having a very talented, or had had a very mm -hmm. talented Pakistani descent um, PhD student mm -hmm. who now um, teaches at the University of Sussex on prevent, mm -hmm. you know what that kind of stuff yeah. is, and has a very distinctive perspective. I'm not going to bother you with this. I'd rather hear your perspective mm -hmm. on this. Um, is this about Pakistanis or is this about Muslims in Britain? And where would you draw a line or where does this overlap as an identity? Thank you. Well, it's about five characters, <laughs> but all five characters they're all British, and that's the primary primary identity. Um, and it's the primary thing that is of interest to me in writing them. They are all British of Pakistani descent. Um, none of them have ever lived in Pakistan. Um, they are Muslims. One is an ex-Muslim who has made a career largely of talking about how he no longer believes any of that. Um, others are on a range of more devout to less devout. Um, and as is the lived experience of most people who follow a religion, they might be devout in one moment and not devout in another. Um, so 
in terms of sort of what the primary identity is, the primary identity is, is actually within their families. Um, those are the primary identities, but they're responding to um, how the world sees them and their moments when the world will see them as Muslim, um, and they ha such as in that interrogation scene, right? Um, and that's what they're, it's not that she came and doing anything, but she's a woman with a certain name and she's wearing a hijab and this happens. Um, and it is, I mean, everyone always laughs when I come to the Great British Bake Off question, but one of the reasons that's in there was I was reading an account of a Br British man, Muslim, who had no convictions of anything, had never done anything illegal, but was dragged into an interrogation room. Um, and one of the questions, th he was asked whether he was British, and you know that's all he'd been. Um, and they asked him, do you watch Dad's Army? Um, there's no reason for anyone to know Dad's Army, but it's a, it's a TV show in Britain, and, and he hadn't watched Dad's Army, and this was considered you know, a bad thing, and maybe he wasn't so British because he hadn't watched Dad's Army. So that the degree of absurdity um, and, you know, I could have chosen to have this interrogation scene be in JFK when she lands or in Logan. Um, but, of course, the point is, this is in her own country. She just, you know, she's on a student visa. She's a British citizen. There has not a single criminal conviction. She's never broken a law. This is the kind of woman who wouldn't run a red light. Um, but w her own country security agencies are calling her in. And more to the point, she's prepared for it. Right, she's prepared for an interrogation scene. Um, so it is about the interplay, I think, of all those things, rather than which one is it. It is what does it mean in different moments to be um, these things, to be British, Muslim, of Pakistani descent. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, this has been really fascinating so far. Um, you kind of got to the uh, core of the question I'm about to ask a little mm -hmm. bit in your um, kind of preface of a talk. But I was wondering, uh, a lot of your books take some of these big political issues that are playing out either in one country or on the world stage, um, and they kind of bring those into very personal narratives about mm -hmm. the characters. And um, you know, obviously, this one fits very well into that description. But uh, for me, I think most of cartography. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I read it, I was a uh, maybe a sophomore, and so I was I was aware of the political undertones of it, mm -hmm. but. Um, I mean, to be fair, I didn't have a very good idea of Pakistani history at the point, though it did um, uh, kind of prompt me to learn more. Mm -hmm. So I was connecting a lot more with the personal narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but in the times I've read it since then, uh, I've definitely connected a lot more, or, or at least understood a lot more, the, mm -hmm. the political behind it as well. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about those, the challenges that you encounter when you're trying to take these big um, political ideas, especially ones that are so in the news. Mm -hmm. uh, um, obviously, even more now than than maybe they were. I, though I'm not sure. Um, and, and you, how you make that into something that does talk about these things, but also keeps it human and and brings people into the personal as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to answer by by referring back to that first question you asked me about you know India Pakistan relations. And actually, the first thing my thi my my mind goes to is my family. You know, um, partition 70 years ago, one of the most cataclysmic historical events of the 20th century, etc. Uh, but half my family is Indian, half my family is Pakistani, and they have relations and they don't have relations. And, you know, so when you ask the question, oh, where did you go? Oh, there you go. So when you ask the question about you know, what the challenges faced about bringing the, the sort of political storyline, the personal, my response is, but that's how I understand stories, um, is that what these big political stories, the reason they matter is because they matter at the human level. You know, it's because they're destroying lives. It's because they're rupturing families. That is how we understand, uh, you know, what is happening. So it's, it doesn't require any work for me. I mean, it does require work for me to write a novel, obviously. Uh, but, but my brain just, you know, it thinks of history and politics in terms of the stories of what happens to people as a, a result of decisions made by other people, which is inevitably how it happens, right? Um, so I've just always thought of stories in that way. And I suppose it's also because I am interested in history and politics, and as a writer, the things you're interested all, all sort of feed into each other. Um, and, I, and I like the fact that people can read at these different registers, that there are those who know the politics and are more interested in it, um, and will see that, and other people will come to the personal storyline, and maybe that will lead them into the history. Um, with this particular one, though, th there was a very particular challenge about writing the politics of this, because I was Googling while Muslim in order to write it. I mean, there is stuff in there around 
um, Muslim radicalization, extremism, etc. And I was made very nervous about doing the research, and I was I was very conscious of the fact that you know I'm researching things, and there's we live in a surveillance state, and there's online surveillance, and I was doing things that I was both laughing at myself for ridiculing myself for doing it. So um, if I went onto two websites around all this nasty stuff, then I would go and look at two websites about celebrity gossip. <laughs> Just say, I'm really okay, you know, it's fine. Um, and it was, you know, but, but also it helped me write the book because I thought, you know, that is the paranoia now. We're living in this world of paranoia and, and this world of being watched and wondering who's listening and how will they respond to um, to knowing what you're interested in. Um, so that was a very different experience to anything else I've I've ever written. Um, I nev I've never quite faced that sort of thing before. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm a great admirer of your work and I have two questions. One, um, mm -hmm. do you have favorites among your books? Uh -huh. And another, whether um, You've had difficulty in Pakistan because of some of the criticisms in mm -hmm. your books, I guess, I think particularly about broken verses. Um, I've had no difficulty in Pakistan. Um, and it's funny, actually, because the things people assume that you know might raise eyebrows are not the things that would raise eyebrows. So I've written about various things. I've actually, the books tend to be very well received. Um, you know, I said in the introduction, um, I've had three awards from the Academy of Letters, which is sort of an official body. Um, and I'm always at the literature festivals, and I don't have any issues with that. Um, there, are, there are certain issues, I think, increasingly, that those of us who write from Pakistan just know not to touch. Um, in particular, the state of Balochistan and what happens there. People get killed for writing about it. Um, and there's that part of me that says, you know, but surely writers should write. And there's that about me says, I'm not doing it, right? Um, so there is the internalized self-censorship that goes on uh, around that particular topic. Um, and no other topic in quite that way, but that particular one really is, um, you know, uh, everyone knows what, what it means t if you try and approach it. Um, but it's interesting because I wrote I've written books on all kinds of things, and I'll tell you the thing that has got me the, the sort of most um, contentious response was my second novel, Salt and Saffron, which I think is the most apolitical book I, of all the books I've written. But within it, there's a woman from an upper middle class family who has a relationship with the cook, the family cook. And this is greatly disliked <laughs> by upper middle class people. And I've had a number of people come up very angry with me about that book. They're not angry about anything else. You know, I'll talk about the 1971 Civil War and the army doing this and doing that, and I'll say certain things around politicians and ethnicities, and that's fine. But class, <laughs> class people get very worked up about. So, you know, you never really know how people will respond to things. Yeah. I did ask, uh, do oh, do I have favorites? The favorite tends to always be the one I'm working on at the moment I'm working on it. Um, so because this is new, it's like the new baby. Um, I suppose I have a particular kind of affection for um, In the City by the Sea, because it was the first. It was the first book that I wrote was while I was in grad school. I remember th the thrill of finding it was going to get published. So there's a, there's a particular kind of affection that I have for it. Yeah. Hi, um, I haven't read the book, mm -hmm. but um, I've really enjoyed the, the sections that you read, and I'm really intrigued, um, and um, I hope to read it. Um, my question for you is more about um, how your work has been received most recently mm -hmm. um, with the all of the you know events that are happening mm -hmm. both in Europe and in the United States mm -hmm. um, around Muslims and the rhetoric um, that's kind of been floating around as a Muslim author, do you find that the reception of your work has changed um, since that time, since, you know, th the time that there, ha there has been all of this kind of rhetoric about Muslims? And, um, and has it been received differently by non-Muslim audiences? Mm -hmm. um, do you find that they're taking a more of an interest in it or that there's a little bit mm -hmm. 
you know, less um, interest. Yeah. Well, I'm going to the, go to the part about when, when you said something, when you, since all the rhetoric started about the Muslim. In the 90s, I was a student, first in upstate New York and then Massachusetts. And in both places, I had a wonderful professor, a man called Agha Shahid Ali, brilliant Kashmiri American poet. And anyone who hasn't read him, go and read him. The collection of poems, The Country Without a Post Office, is one of just the best things written. Um, and Shahid used to, whenever he did events, would always mention that he was Muslim. And he'd always mention he's Shia. And after I'd known about five years, and I'd been to many events and seen him do this without fail every time when he was doing public event, and I said, Shahid, you're the most secular human being I know. Why do you do that? And he said, and this was 1995, he said, because we're in America, and there's a view of Muslims and of Shias, we're sort of bearded loonies. We throw rocks, we protest, we go to war, we're screaming. If you're a woman, you're oppressed. He said, what I want, he said, I mentioned that I'm a Muslim every time I'm there. So the next time someone hears the word Muslim, instead of just seeing the picture in their heads of you know, someone burning a book or someone wanting to kill someone else, maybe they'll see a poet. Um, so when you say that w since this rhetoric against Muslims started, it's been there my whole life. Um, in 1990, I think it was Time Magazine had a, had a cover it was either, yeah, it, it might have only been, I don't know if it was in, in all the Time magazine covers, but I remember in Pakistan seeing this Time magazine cover, um, and it had a picture of an arm holding a Kalashnikov and a minaret in the back, and it said, Islam, colon, the new enemy, question mark, 1990. So it's always been there. I've always known it's been there. Not everyone has known that it's always been there, but these things don't come from nowhere. So I've always been working and operating within that world. Um, it's now reached sort of critical mass at the point where no one can ignore the fact it's there. Um, this book's only been out a couple of weeks, so it's still very early days and hard to say. But it has been receiving huge attention and response. And partly, I think, it's because my publishers have been doing a wonderful job with it. But I do think that it's because it feels to me that in America there are conversations and there's a recognition of political urgency and there's a recognition of the damage of political rhetoric um, and of stereotypes that have been building now for a very long time unchecked and what the consequences are of those kind of things. Um, so I do think that that is going to be part of the conversation around the book. Um, and I'm already beginning to notice that it is. But at the same time, you know, as I said, these things aren't new. They're just getting worse. I'm uh, really intrigued by the structure of the novel mm -hmm. as a retelling of Antigone and your discussion of being focused on the line about the sister being lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been interested in other retelling. Mm -hmm. It's the way they bring out something else, like the Gospel at Colonus is a musical that emphasizes the religious notes, uh, seeing the adaptation of Hamlet into Hyder really yeah. uh, is you know, mm -hmm. family, how sure. hard it is to escape family. And so I was wondering if you uh, could talk some about your own thoughts of people who play in this format and mm -hmm. uh, decisions made about what you think is uh, under discussed or in the you know, the classic text. It under discussed in the Antigone text. Well, yeah. uh, just in general, as they have you had any other thoughts of doing similar adaptations or has this caused you to think back on other things? If I were to do mm -hmm. a second book in this yeah. style, what would I emphasize? Actually, what it made me think was because there was a way in which I did end up having a lot of fun with it. Um, and my thought is, oh, what a pity I can't do that again because then I'll be the writer who does that, <laughs> right? And you don't ever want to be the writer who does that. Um, but it, it, I am interested in adaptation and I'm interested in writers who can take something and make, make it their own. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned Heather, which is the sort of Vishal Bharadwaj's retelling of Hamlet written by Basharat Peer. Um, but I also love, with, you know, within his work, Makbul, which is Macbeth yeah. as an, you know, sort of a don in the underworld in Bombay. Um, and it's brilliant. And one of the things that, that I think these adaptations have to do is they have to work on their own merit. They have to work for someone who doesn't know the original. But they have to work for someone who does know the original and is still going to be delighted and surprised by the way the adaptations happen. 
but the other thing I realized that the more I was thinking about Antigone, the more I started to take that original text personally. Um, and start to get very annoyed by the fact that when people are writing around it, they don't seem sufficiently to me to write about grief. Um, that they write about injustice, they write about law, they you know, there are all these different things. And, and the more I read it, the more I think, here is a girl whose brother's corpse is going to be pulled apart by dogs and crows, you know. Is she, te is she motivated by injustice? Is she motivated by religion? She's motivated by grief. She's motivated by sort of the craziness of what would happen if that beloved body which is lost to you is going to be further lost to you. And, and so the, import the importance of rituals of mourning and burial and why we all, every culture in the world has some kind of very specific ritual of burial and mourning and how important it is. Um, and it, it did make me actually think about the terrible tragedy of people who don't ever get to do that for their loved ones' bodies. So the people whose families are disappeared and you never see them. Um, and for some reason or the other, you never get to do that. Um, and how strange it is as human beings that we just need those rituals. Um, even though you know the person is gone, um, you need to do that final act for them, and you need to do it properly. And if you don't, you feel so lost. Um, and that aspect of it, that really human part of what it means to lose someone, um, I think that was something that, that really came out for me um, from the play, and, and I hope is somewhere within the book as well. Yeah. Any other questions? So I was actually wondering if you could speak a little bit about, you said that you um, were sort of commissioned to mm -hmm. write, uh, adapt Antigone yeah. into a play mm -hmm. first, yeah. set in London with mm -hmm. a Pakistani cast. Um, so I'm just wondering what that process was like. And also I assume that after that, after writing the play is when you wrote the novel. So that's a whole nother yeah. process. You see, now you would assume <laughs> that. But in oh fact, what happened was, I started to think about it. I thought the storyline, I thought, I'm not a playwright, I'm a novelist. I'm going to write it as a novel. Um, I did try, to, in my defense, I did try to think, how would I do this as a play? And I just realized, this is not what my brain does. You know, I'm a novelist who ju has finished the last novel, who needs a next novel, here's an idea. How am I not gonna make it a novel? Um, and so then I had to, um, write an email to Jatinder Verma, the man who'd asked me to do this, and say, Jatinder, um, can I come and see you? I owe you an apology and a huge debt of thanks. And he said, I have no idea what you're talking about, but come and see me. And, and I said, I said I'm, I'm not doing that. And he said, oh, okay. And I said, except I am doing it, you know, for me. <laughs> um, and it's going to be a novel and of no use to you whatsoever. And he was actually lovely. and. and um, I think not enough is said sometimes about the generosity of people in the arts towards each other um, and the genuine delight with which people are told, you gave me an idea that I'm using. And he was genuinely delighted and he said, well, that's fine, we'll do an event for you at my theater. And he is in, um, in September, I'm going to be you know, in conversation with um, a wonderful woman from the BBC talking about the books in his fine theater. So. It'll get to live a bit at its place of origin. Um, he did say at the time, he said, well, maybe when I read the novel, maybe there's a play within your novel. And I said, <laughs> I said, Jatinder, I don't know how to write it. So maybe someone else will. Yeah. I have an interest in the process of mm -hmm. uh, getting a book published and, and what the experience is like. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I'm wondering, since you've gotten, uh, I think it's seven books published so far, I'm wondering how the experience has changed for you going from a first-time novelist mm -hmm. to now a seven-time novelist. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I'm wondering, uh, in dealing with publishers, how, how, is, how are the challenges different? I, I'm gonna imagine that for a first book, the big challenge is just getting noticed, getting mm -hmm. attention. Uh, I, I'm curious what kind of challenges you're encountering now that you've got several under your belt. Well, I'm lucky because I've actually been with the same people in the UK, you know, f 
for now scarily almost 20 years now, uh, which is wonderful because those kind of long-term relationships are, are increasingly rare in publishing. Um, and there's a kind of safety net in that, that we, my editor, a woman called Alexandra Pringle, um, who was my agent on my first novel and then, you know, and I who first met me when I was 21. Um, so she's just been sort of like a fairy godmother in my life. Um, she met me when I was 21. She saw a four-page short story I'd written, and she said, turn this into a novel and send it to me. Um, and that became my first published novel. It also turned out that she had, in a previous incarnation, um, had worked at Virago Books, which was the great feminist press. And um, that first time I met her, I was 21. She was the most sort of extraordinary, glamorous, brilliant woman I'd ever seen. Um, and I could barely speak. <laughs> and I said, you used to work at Virago? And she said, yes. And I said, you know, they... Um, they published as a modern classic a, a book written by my great aunt. And she said, what is your great aunt's name? And I said, Atiyah Hussain. And she said, I published those books. Um, so it turned out my, my great aunt was you know, republished by her in the 80s. And then she said, well, you know, I believe in these kinds of things and you know, we have to keep in touch. Um, and I'm now, because I'm a novelist, I'm going to a little story, which is, um, so she became my agent. And because she'd largely worked as an editor and was, you know, then went back to being an editor, was briefly an agent, um, she really edited that novel for me. And I think that's a thing that a lot of writers miss now, is that it's getting increasingly rare to have editors who really sit down line by line and go through things. Um, and, you know, we got into shape and she sent it out to publishers and, you know, it was, there's no drama in the story, you know, except that she sent a couple of places said no and then Granta in the UK said yes. But the, the part of the story that to me is particularly moving is my great aunt Athia was at that point very unwell and was in a hospital. And my mother, um, I think this was the days of fax, my mother faxed the, her daughter, my great aunt's daughter, my aunt Shama, to say that the book was being published. And my aunt told my great aunt that it's being published in Alexandra Yole, the editor, as the agent. And she smiled. and slipped into unconsciousness very soon after and died. Um, so, you know, there are these great m strange things that happen in the world. Um, and so it feels right that I've been with Alexandra since. And, and what I'm very lucky is I've never had an editor or publisher tell me what to write. It is, I think, what a lot of writers, you know, you often get told, well, is there an expectation? Do they tell you you should be writing these kinds of books or those kinds of books? Um, and I've never had that. Um, but of course, what gets harder is actually internally. You know, the, the sort of books I was writing 15 years ago, I pro could probably do much more easily now, but I don't want to do them. And you keep wanting to challenge yourself and take more risks. Um, and that's the really tough part, is it gets harder. You know, the writing gets harder. Um, but, you know, the publishing, and, you know, I've had a very different story in America. I've had a number of publishers. The books get published. They disappear without a trace. That's largely what's happened. Um, Burn Shadows got a little more attention. But, you know, a few readers find every book. So um, that's why you'll find people saying, well, I've been reading you since cartography. And, I, you know, that's great. Um, and then this one, number seven, is actually the first time that I've had a book with this kind of reception here. So that's been fantastic. Um, but you never know, it's a weird thing. One of my novels was a bestseller in Norway. <laughs> Ran for weeks and weeks on the bestseller list. You know, I can't explain it. It's sort of a strange world. All you can do is write the books as best as you can um, and send them out and, and hope that you'll have publishers who believe in them um, and do their best for them and, and that, you know, there'll be a few hundred thousand Norwegians who might be enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask you, since there are a number of South Asians here, um, yes. who's the greatest cricketer and why? <laughs> I think uh, I think what of some people might not. Of any era? Uh, sure. <laughs> of any era of any nation? Sure, as long as you don't want to get in trouble. Vasim Akram. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's the end. You're a sort of s you're a searing journalist, and <laughs> this is what you're giving me. Fine. Vasim Akram, Brian Lara. Okay, do you know what they have in common? Uh, Left-handed. Uh, lefties. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, American non-cricket people. It's sort of, <laughs> it's an essential component of, of any gathering where you have enough South Asians. We have to have that moment. <laughs>